Okay. So thanks for joining us everyone tonight um, and keep throwing in the chat where you're watching from tonight or if you're watching locally, how long you've lived in Peters Township. That's so interesting for us to see. Um, we're really excited to be offering our second Stories from the Archives program tonight. My name is Lacey Love. I'm the director of the Peters Township Library. And before we begin our program tonight, I'd like to speak a little bit about the library archives. Last month, the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission notified us that we would be a recipient of a $3,450 historical and archival records care grant, which was very exciting news. With these grant funds, the library will be able to purchase equipment to digitize and provide online access to materials in the archives that are oversized or in fragile condition. And once we digitize them, these 19th century records will be available to the public through the PA Photos and Documents website while ensuring preservation of the originals that are very fragile. The Peters Township Library Foundation will generously match this grant with funding to extend the work of Carolyn Friedrich, who is our consulting archivist. Uh, Carolyn will lead this digitization project by establishing guidelines and training staff and volunteers. If you are interested in further supporting the library archives, there are two ways you can do that. If you would like to help us continue Carolyn's work, help the archives purchase supplies, equipment, things like that, there's a link on the library's website where you can donate to the foundation. Um, and as you're doing the donation, there's a little note that you can say you would like that donation to go towards the local history room or the archives. Uh, the other way you can support the archives is that we are always interested in historic Peters Township uh, original photos and documents and historic does not mean necessarily the 1800s or 1910s, you know, even up to the 1970s, 80s, 90s, we would love to have original donations for the archives. And so if you have something that you think might be of interest to us, feel free to reach out to myself or to Margaret. This evening's program tells the story of the village of McMurray from the late 1800s through the 1940s, a time when McMurray Village emerged as a town center in Peters Township. The story is told through materials in the archives, including original photographs, documents, letters, programs, and memorabilia, all shared by generous donors from Peters Township. Our presenters this evening are library staff members, Margaret Dietzer and Carrie Weaver. And we have a special guest with us, Tom McMurray, who is a lifelong Peters Township resident, Peters Township school board president, and a direct descendant of the McMurray family. Um, and Tom will join Margaret and Carrie at the end for questions and, you know, as everybody shares their memories of Peters Township. So I will turn it over to Margaret and Carrie. All right, Carrie, are you ready to? I'm ready. I need to slide advance to the next slide. There we go. Thank you, Lacey. My name is Carrie Weaver. I'm the public relations coordinator for the library. My husband and I moved to Peters Township recently in 1984, so from Allegheny County, and I've seen many changes in the 38 years I've lived here. Tonight, we are presenting the history of McMurray based on information shared with the library archives and research done by the team of staff and volunteers who've worked on tonight's program. We recognize that many families settled in McMurray, and I saw several of their names in the registration list joining us tonight. Your ancestors worked very hard through difficult times with very little and contributed to make McMurray the village it is today. Let's start by looking back at an important area in the village of McMurray, the intersection of McMurray and Valley Brook Road. To give you some perspective, the photo on your left is from the Robert Matthews Family Papers. This is the Valley Brook Road and East McMurray Road intersection in approximately 1910. The photo on the right is the same general area in July 2018 via the Google Maps. Over 100 years later, nothing remains the same as that first photo other than the roads. Why are we focusing on this intersection? From the late 1800s onward, McMurray Road was the main route for travel from Pittsburgh through Upper St. Clair to Cannonsburg. In other words, everyone passed through this area, used this road. We sent you a link with a video called Historic Photos of McMurray Road in 1919 that was created by Time Travels with Tim. If you watch that video, you will see photos of McMurray Road 
beginning at the intersection of Bethel Church Road to the Bethel Park Peters Township line. The images are from the Allegheny County Public Works Department from 1919, and they will be aligned in the video with 2016 photos from the same locations on McMurray Road. After seven years of construction, there was a grand opening of McMurray Road on July 6, 1926. The project to pave the Washington County portion of McMurray Road didn't begin until 1932. The 1920 census reports Peters Township had a population of 1,660. In comparison, the 2020 census reports the population at 22,946. And current township statistics report that 26,000 vehicles pass through the McMurray Valley Brook intersection every day. This continues to be the main thoroughfare through the township. Now Margaret's going to discuss one of the founding families in this area. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you, Lacey and Carrie. And I join both of you in welcoming, welcoming all of our guests to our event this night, tonight, our second program on stories from the archives. As Lacey mentioned in her introduction, the present presentation tonight is focused on the McMurray Town Center and the development occurring at the intersection of McMurray Road with Valley Brook Road. Let me, let me start this program tonight with an excerpt from Barbara Turner Williams' 1976 book, Peters Township Heritage, A Brief History of Peters, Peters Township, Washington County, Pennsylvania. This book is available in our library, both as borrowed and it's also available for sale at the circulation desk in the library. So in Barbara Turner Williams' words, she's writing about the villages of Peters Township. In particular, one family, the McMurrays, generated a string of enterprises, not the least of which was the town of McMurray. The McMurrays had farmed on Brush Run east of Thompsonville before the Civil War. This operation proved so successful that in 1881, Harvey McMurray operated a flour mill at the village site. His son James managed the McMurray grocery store and became the local postmaster in 1880. These enterprises proved lucrative despite the competition of other more established merchants in Peters Township. The younger McMurray expanded his scope of action into communications in 1902 when he helped organize and became president of the township's first telephone service, the McMurray Telephone Company. The telephone company was situated in part of the McMurray store. So more about Herbie McMurray and Emily McMurray. Herbie McMurray is recognized as the founder of the village that is named for his family. Herbie was descendants of Irish immigrants, James McMurray and Isabella Valentine McMurray. They settled in Allegheny County in the early part of the 19th century. Herbie was born in, 19, in 1829 and he died in 1902. And Emily Mac McMurray was born in 1829 and she died in 1894. Herbie and Emily were married in 1855. Shortly after in 1856, they moved to Peters Township and they acquired close to 300 acres of land then Hervey purchased a flock of sheep around 400 to 500, and he became a wealthy landowner and farmer. He purchased a flour mill in 1865 that was destroyed by fire the following year. Following his purchase of that flour mill in 1865, this area 
was previously referred to as Brush Run, soon became known as McMurray's Mill. So the next slide. Barry? Why did people Why did set, set, settle in this settle area? In area? After Charles Penn purchased land from the Indians from the Six Nations tribe in 1768, he began selling parcels in southwestern Pennsylvania. 100 acres could be purchased for five pounds. Virginia was issuing land grants at the same time, thinking they owned the same area in southwestern Pennsylvania. With Pennsylvania and Virginia selling land grants, many people began to settle in this area. Most of the early settlers were farmers because the land was fruitful and they could make a living through agriculture. As Margaret explained, Hervey McMurray and his bride, Emily, of one year moved to Peters Township the year after they were married. Emily's father was already a wealthy landowner in Washington County. This hand-drawn map from the McMurray family shows the tracts of land that were conveyed by Hervey McMurray to his five sons in 1902 at the time of his death. The son settled along Thomas, Valley Brook, and McMurray Roads. In addition, gas wells were operated on five farms owned by the McMurray family members, and the wells supplied the power for the flour mill and fuel for heating many nearby homes. Next slide, please. This is the earliest photo in the archives showing the McMurray estate located at the intersection of Valley Brook and East McMurray Roads in the late 1880s. As you can see, building A is the McMurray flour mill. The structure B is the covered bridge over McMurray Road and building C is the brick home with the wood frame. This home was purchased by Hervey McMurray for his firstborn son, James Harvey McMurray, and his wife, Sarah Sadie McCabe McMurray. The home also served as the location of a general store established in 1880. And Margaret has more details to share about this photo. Okay, I think Carrie mentions building. So if you can focus on C. C is the brick home that uh, James McMurray lived in. At the same time that the flour mill was built, they added on to that red brick home, they added on a wooden structure and, at the, and they built the general store. So you first came the flour mill, then came this general store that James McMurray um, managed. So in the same year, 1880, you have the flour mill, then you have the general store, and then they established a post office in that general store. And that post office was in operation from 1880 to 1902. And the first postmaster, of course, as expected, was Herbie McMurray. And then the, um, that was followed by um, James McMurray, who, uh, was the, who was the postmaster, I think, up until it closed, although the year is 1902 the year that Herbie McMurray passed away, I think 1902, the uh, post office no longer operated because rural mail service began. So at this same site, although it is not in the picture, at least I can see it in the picture, there operated a cooperative dairy. And this was really big because it was known as Herbie's Co-op Dairy. It was very important because farmers could bring their milk and their milk then, of course, was produced into uh, dairy products. And the dairy products could go to market from uh, after being produced at this cooperative co-op or uh, the alternative is the farmers had to get their own milk. And at that time, it was probably down through Hill Station. And by then, the train was operating and it would go to Pittsburgh. But this was an alternative. And it must have been pretty popular because it stayed around and served the area farmers from 1895 to around 1915. So there the um, farmers could buy their dairy products and they could also be served by bringing their milk there. Um, there's another kind of interesting story around this McMurray. Every village, as Barbara Turner states in her book, every village 
had to have its blacksmith shop. So the blacksmith shop, and I don't believe you can see it in this picture because it was supposed to be across from the uh, flour mill located at the site that later became the dairy bar. Well, here there are some materials in the archives say that it was a blacksmith shop opened by, in 1885 by Isaac Simpson and then operated for years by Isaac and his sons. But there's also some other materials that say one of the McMurray uh, family members operated a blacksmith. But in any way, every village had its blacksmith shop. So I think we're ready for a next slide and for you, Carrie. Okay. This is the slide that you saw at the very beginning um, when you entered the room for the program tonight. Uh, this is the photo you saw that's approximately from 1910. You can already see several changes from the previous photo. The covered bridge is gone and a new bridge over Brush Run Creek was constructed. Building A towards the background was the brick and wooden frame home that Margaret's been mentioning that was bought by Hervey McMurray for his son James who raised his family there. The building is believed to have been in existence since 1876. Building B is the McMurray Mill. Building C is an equipment shed and building B was William J. McMurray's barn for her horses for the mill. William was another son of Herbie and Emily. The barn was torn down in the 1930s. McMurray Road is in the foreground and you can see it is still not paved. And Margaret has some details about the McMurray home in the photo. Oh yes, a couple. So if I can get your attention up to that, my favorite place there, Building A, that's the store where the uh, James McMurray lived in the red brick home, and then the wooden attachment had the general store. Well, in eight, 1902, you're going to hear that date a lot. Um, in 1902, the McMurray Post Office ceased operations. However, Herbie McMurray established the McMurray Telephone Company in a corner of the store. And so the telephone company operated from the McMurray General Store until around 1922. James McMurray served as the president of the telephone company, and his wife, Sadie, became the chief operator of the telephone company. And then we're ready for the next slide. That would be me. That's you, Margaret. That's me. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is a photo of one of Tom McMurray's um, photographs. So the slide of uh, the uh, McMurray flour mill looks really, really good here. And um, the new mill was built as a state of the art roller process mill. It was powered by steam, producing a better product and also increasing to 50, increasing production to 50 barrels a day. This flour mill was built on, it was located on Rush Run, the same as the earlier flour mill. However, it was located on the opposite bank from the previous flour mill. The, um, and Carrie mentioned this earlier, gas from wells on the McMurray family farms produced the fuel to operate the roller process mill. You get a feeling that this was really big activity and those are not just words that it was a um, that it was a very productive and it became well known because the mill produced snowball flour and golden beauty corn mill. So it was it was functioning at a different level than probably the very small flour mill that he bought in 1865 that was really um, established in 1840 and actually went back as far as 1830. But here we are. And it is Snowball Flour and Golden Beauty Corn Mill. This flour mill distributed flour throughout Western Pennsylvania, shipping a carload of flour a month to Pittsburgh. The McMurray Mill also shipped flour as far west as Minnesota. At that time, and we're talking 1880 to 1930, Minneapolis was the flour capital of the world. By this time, John McMurray 
and William McMurray, sons of Herbie McMurray, owned and operated the mill following the death of their father. Another fact about this mill that it was so important, it was known as a custom work mill. There weren't too many of these in Western Pennsylvania. So throughout Western Pennsylvania, farmers brought their wheat and their grain, and it was ground into flour and cornmeal and feed while they waited. I think the stories tell that during these days visits, um, they could almost get a year's supply when, um, when their grain was ground. And if you recall earlier, I said that there was a co-op, the um, dairy co-op that was located at this site. So therefore traveling to the McMurray's mill became a social event for families where they could spend a day in this area. Homespun News, an article in 1972, mentions the McMurray Mill was the manufacturing and commercial center of Peters Township. So next slide. Okay, here's a cute photo of a young woman and a dog. And we've included this photo to show you another view of the mill traveling north on McMurray Road. Unfortunately, we do not have the name of the young woman or the dog or the date of the photo, but we estimated it would have been around the late 1930s when the mill was no longer operational, because you can see it was, it was shuttered up there. You can see also that McMurray Road is finally paved. The photographer would have been standing in the parking area in front of the telephone company across the street from the mill. This photo demonstrates the valuable historical details that can be garnered unintentionally. When you may be going through old photos in your family collection, consider the important details, historical details that are included, such as the mill in the background in this photo. Please remember this if you're thinking about donating any original photos to the Peters Township archives. Well, Next you know, Carrie, oh. Oh, Carrie, before we move on, Sure. Uh, this was a real find of yours because all these McMurray <laughs> flour mill photographs show it from the back with the, with the stacks. Right. So right. when Carrie brought this photo to me, I said, no, 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 I don't see those stacks. Carrie said, you're looking at it from the front. So I think this is really kind of a priceless photograph. Right. And um, that's from the Lattimore. But um, anyway, thanks, Carrie. And now I guess we can go to the next slide. Right. This is a, just a beautiful picture, a beautiful idyllic scene in Peters Township from the Hutchison family papers of the Montour Railroad train traveling through Peters Township. Uh, this photo is one of the 10 photos featured on the historical note cards being sold at the library to benefit the work being done to um, pay for the work being done in the Peters Township archives. Next slide. So on this slide, I've added some text to identify McMurray Road, Thomas Road, and the tracks of the Montour Railroad. Now the Arrowhead Trail. Think about the history beneath your feet the next time you are walking along on that trail. A little information about the railroad in Peters Township, and there's a lot of information, and I'm just going to be brief. Beginning in 1877, the Montour Railroad was hauling coal in Western Pennsylvania for the Imperial Coal Company. By 1879, passenger service was being offered, and the railroad also carried mail and local products to Pittsburgh through a connection with the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad, and the products were sold at markets in downtown Pittsburgh. Between 1912 and 1914, the Montour Railroad built a section of track through Peters Township. These cars hauled coal, lumber, and products from local businesses, including the McMurray General Store. Pittsburgh and Lake Erie purchased, Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad purchased the Montour Railroad tracks in 1975, but they abandoned them a few years later. However, in 1985, Peters Township purchased 100 acres of abandoned railroad tracks to create the Arrowhead Trail. So in case you didn't know it, that Arrowhead Trail used to be the Montour Railroad line through Peters Township. Now next I have a couple of um, slides, a, a couple of photos 
that pertain to education in Peter's Township during this time period. And I want to read a short excerpt from the 1930s Peter's Township High School Dedication Program. So early history of Peter's Township High School. The desire for better educational facilities in Peter's Township which had only been partially satisfied by the summer school conducted at Bower Hill and the select school at McMurray and by Jefferson Academy of Cannonsburg brought about the establishment of the Peters Township High School in the autumn of 1902. And that is referring to the photo you see on your left. The board of school directors at that time consisted of W.J. Johnson president, Ben T. Jones secretary, William Fawcett, J. Harvey McMurray and Hal, Casbar. The school began with one teacher and an enrollment, which at one time the first year reached 29 students, including two girls who were completing in the newly organized school high school courses, which they had begun elsewhere. The school course was a three year course, following closely that outlined by the state, giving the school a second class rating. At the end of the first year, commencement exercises were held at the Bower Hill Schoolhouse. Mary, the two graduates, Mary Patterson and Emily Matthews, they sang a duet together and undergraduates furnished the rest of the performances on the program. During the first two years of its existence, the school housed in a dwelling owned by H. McMurray, located about one half mile from McMurray's Mill. The school furniture consisted of a plain enough kitchen chairs to seat pupils and a large table which served as the teacher's desk. Half day sessions only were held and the students recited continuously during the time they were at school. Home study was the observed rule. No transportation was provided by the district, but sheds were provided where students who rode to school might shelter their horses. Attendance was exceptionally good in spite of the fact that some of the students had long distances to travel and the roads were bad. And you saw what kind of condition those roads were in. They were pretty bad. Most of the students walked from one to four miles. Some rode horseback and a few came in buggies. Many interesting stories must have been told about the upset cart, the house trouser clad horse, and the interruptions of classes to disentangle Prince from his harness, to round up old Dick after he had broken his hitching strap and to treat the old gray mare for colic. In 1904, the school was moved to the new frame building in which it continued until the, pre the present year. This was in 1930. So that is pertaining to the photo on the right of your screen. The two rooms of this building with folding doors between them afforded opportunities for enlarged school activities. Tables for students were provided, a flag was raised with appropriate exercises, and a community literary society was organized. No longer could young men call at the back door to try to make dates with the girls because there was no back door. So that's from the 1930 new high school dedication program. And that's possibly for another topic. <laughs> Thanks, Carrie. That was pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I Morgan. think by now, I think our audience should have a sense that we are so grateful that you have shared these photographs with us and our documents that tell the story of this great community, Peter's Township. All right, I guess I'm ready for the next slide. Is that it, Gary? I'm the Yes, ready? you're up next, Margaret. Okay, thanks. All right, so a um, couple of slides back, Carrie talked about the Montour Railroad, and um, she spoke how 1912, 1914, the railroad tracks through Peter's Township were built. So this is the house and the railroad tracks. This house was built then right after railroad tracks through Peters Township. So this house was built in 1914, 19 to 19. It was built by James Harvey McMurray and his wife, Sadie McMurray. Now that house is located very close to the railroad tracks right by the Montour Trail. So if you take a good look at that house, the next slide is going to show it in a more contemporary photograph. But that photograph is around 1919. So James and Sadie had lived in the uh, red brick home with the store and James managed that. So here we are, 19, 1914, 1990, this beautiful home they built. 
sadly, in 1920, soon after they moved into their new home, James McMurray died from a fatal car accident. And following this, his son Joseph moved out of the red brick home that was right behind this home. He and his wife, Nan Townsend McMurray, moved into the home with his mother, Sadie. When they moved in, the home was modified to create two separate living quarters, including a second set of stairs along with a kitchen on the second floor of the home. And when James vacated the home, um, and he, uh, so into that home, the red brick home, the chief telephone operator and her daughters moved into the red brick home of the late James McMurray. And I know Kate uh, is going to talk about this other video that she watched. And I think in there, it actually tells you the name of the um, telephone operator that moved in into the home and lived there right. and also um, was the chief telephone operator at that time. So, um, so just take another, just focus on this photo and then we can go ahead to the next slide. Okay. Now that is the same home, which I'm sure most of not all of you recognize. This photo was taken in 2012 and it shows the home when it was occupied by farmhouse coffee. And, um, so that home, the last McMurray family member to live in that home was Bill McMurray. And he lived in the home, I believe, until 1992 when he moved out and um, then the house was sold. So I think we can um, go to the next slide. So at that time, uh, a Joseph, or James McMurray passed away. His son, Joseph McMurray, was taking over um, then some of the family operations. So in 1922, Joseph McMurray built a new general store on McMurray Road. He built this store directly across the street from the old store. So that old store was located behind the White House. You couldn't see it in the picture but it was built on McMurray Road and so across the street. So it was built in 1922. 1923, the very next year, the general store burnt down. So Joseph McMurray decided to go out of the general store business and not rebuild the store. What he did was the only thing remaining from the burned building was its foundation. And since the McMurray family was still operating the McMurray Telephone Company, he decided to build, he decided to build a separate building for the telephone company and to build this on top of the foundation. So he did that. And then the um, telephone company operated, the McMurray Telephone Company operated for that building, which Carrie can show you in the next slide, until um well, what well, the McMurray Telephone Company was operated from 1923 then in that building up to either 1929, 1931, sometime around there. The Bell Telephone Company purchased the McMurray Telephone Company. And we do have some deeds that show um, some of the transactions. For years, the McMurray Telephone Company operated as an independent telephone company, although they used the telephone equipment. So here we have the um, McMurray Telephone Company using Bell Telephone Equipment. And in 1931, the Bell Telephone Company takes over the McMurray Telephone Company, but they leased the building from Joseph McMurray. So more about this new telephone company uh, from Carrie. Next slide. So, okay, oh. these photos show the transition from the general store on the left towards uh, to the McMurray Telephone Company, which is the photo in the center. And then the last photo on your right are the other businesses that occupied that same foundation, that same building 
that you may recall, like sheer success and dairy delight. That was kind of something I remembered when I moved in here for, in 1984, that, that those businesses were in that building. In 1956, the Bell Telephone Company broke ground on a new telephone company up on Bell Drive. The building, this 1995, nine, in 1996, the building was demolished during the reconstruction of the McMurray Valley Brook intersection. And today, if you drive through the intersection, the, this was located where the small park-like setting is with a few parking spots that provide access to the Arrowhead Trail near the overpass on McMurray Road. Next slide, please. One of the videos we suggested you watch to supplement our program tonight is a Senior Perspectives video with the late Irma Grego, one of the participants of the library's Peters Township Oral History Project. In this video includes interviews with several township residents, Ivan Forgy, Dolly Wolf Gorcello, Martha Lattimore, whose photographs these are from her collection, Anna Mae McMurray, Tom Milligan, and Ruth Soltz. Several of them will share their memories about working with the switchboard for the McMurray Telephone Company. You will learn what it was like to share a party line where multiple customers are all connected on the same phone line. The other photo on the right is a favorite of mine. This is Mac McKissick, a telephone foreman standing next to the Belf telephone truck. This photo taken during World War II the photo features a sign on the truck that reminds you, war needs the wires. Keep all calls brief. And this, this um, particular photo is also one featured in our local history um, note cards that are on sale at the library. Next slide, please. Okay, Carrie, before we do, if I could just sure. add one thing to this. I um, just wanted to share with you, many of you may already know this, but we did that project with the Heinz History Center, and I think it was around 2005 we wrapped it up. But all of these oral histories and the PDF files have been uploaded to PA photos and documents. And you've been sent, you've been sent the link to, to go to PA photos and documents, and you can see some of these photos there, and you can listen to, um, for instance, you can listen to Martha Lattimore because she participated right. in that. Right. So in addition to watching the, um, the uh, DVD or the, on the video on the telephone company, you can also uh, access these um, oral histories. Next slide. Okay, the Boy Scout camp was just a cherished uh, cabin. It was, turned out to be a community event People that have fond memories of Peters Township always share their stories about the Boy Scout cabin. This Boy Scout cabin was built in 1934, uh, late 1934, perhaps early 1935. At any rate, the cabin was constructed from a log home from one of the original McMurray family log cabins. So originally, they planned to build the, the um, Boy Scout cabin with telephone poles, but they ended up hauling the logs. When they dismantled the logs from the home, they hauled it over to the site and um, they built the log cabin. And when they uh, took, when let's see, let's say all the corner logs in the old log home were marked when they were taken down. And when the new, when the Boy Scout cabin was built, all the corners were placed in their same positions as they were in the home. So um, according to a February 11th, 1935 newspaper article, approximately 120 persons and firms united to construct the log cabin at McMurray on the banks of Rush Run. Many of you here with us tonight can probably recall that the Boy Scout cabin was destroyed by fire. That was in 1967. Next slide. We have photos of the log cabin, photos of the, the Haas, the Haas from which the log cabin came. We have, I think, four separate photos of the Boy Scout cabin, and we have the program all uploaded 
to PA photos and documents. The cabin was um, dedicated February 11th, 1935. There were several newspaper articles written. So it was a pretty big community event. That dedication program, if you get a chance to look at it, it includes names of the cabin workers, names of the scouts, the program, the participants, the donors, and the troop officers. Again, we are just really privileged to receive such valuable materials from those who uh, lived in Peters Township. Um, next slide. So sadly, the story of the flour mill comes to an end. Shortly after World War II, this is around 1918, flour mill consolidations and new technologies forced the closure of the smaller mills. And the McMurray Mill was no longer a significant supplier, nor did it serve as the custom work mill. In 1936, the mill shuttered. In 1946, the mill was torn down to make improvements and the newspaper article says to, for the McMurray Venetian Highway, which was to be rebuilt by the Pennsylvania State Highway Department. Another newspaper article, and this was written in 1946, the article stated, when they tear down the old mill at McMurray, it will mark the end of an era in the hills south of Pittsburgh. Although the wheels haven't turned for a decade in the mill, many a farmer can recall the day-long wagon haul to McMurray Brothers, where their wheat was ground into flour and their corn into feed. So our next slide is a pretty important slide. This is just a genuine heartfelt thanks to all those folks that contributed the photographs, the documents, the letters, and the other programs, and all the materials that Carrie and I were to research for tonight's program. And that Carol and Frederick can go on and make sure that we're following the archival standards, the best practices, to uh, preserve these materials, to organize these materials, to prepare, to, um, to prepare finding aids for these materials. And we received the permission from PA Photos and Documents to share these with you in their digital format. And of course, um, uh, you have to follow um, uh, digital procedures, um, the, the ones that are prescribed to upload, upload your your materials to PA photos and documents. So a, a big thank you to the Hutchison family, to Ralph Kessler, to the Lattimore family, to Liebarger family, to the Matthews family, and to the McMurray sisters that donated the, the, the materials from their parents, to Tom McMurray and his family who's here with us tonight, and to Boyd Caldwell Roach's family. And also special thanks to those that helped Carrie and I through this program. And we just appreciate it, every, every help that we've been given along the way. Um, we also want to thank our audience because it is your interest. We know how much you love Peter's Township because many of you are followers of Robert Moore, Robert Moore and the, um, the Facebook page, Peter's Township down memory lane. So we have a great audience, and we hope that you will continue to share your many priceless photos and photographs and archival materials with the new, with the Peters Township Public Library archives. So um, thank you for the Peters Township Library Foundation for their continued support of the Peters Township Library archives and to supporting Carolyn Frieder the consulting archivist who is leading this effort. Uh, also, thanks to Tom McMurray and Jean McMurray Hutchinson for their assistance with this program and for Tom to staying with us and to help us navigate through these questions and comments that you've shared with us. So Carrie, I know you wanna add some uh, closing comments too. Sure. sure. <clears throat> 
I just want to mention that Margaret is speaking to you from the um, local history room. And behind her, you could see all the boxes uh, filled with archival materials that were donated to the library. So I think that's pretty, pretty awesome that she is actually in that room and, and she, that's where she is speaking from tonight. Um, so thank you everyone joining us tonight. There's so many great um, memories mentioned in the chat. People from all over the United States are here with us and uh, sharing their memories and comments. Um, I, I would like to ask you to please take a moment at the end here and uh, complete the brief survey we've put on the screen before you leave. We are um, planning to do more of these programs, but they do take a lot of time. Uh, to put together and we, we try to do the best job we can with the archival materials available to us. So please um, give an indication of your interest, what program you prefer uh, from the list that is on the screen there. If you have any questions or comments, go ahead and type them into the chat and we're going to try to respond to as many of them as we can. Um, our last slide the one after this uh, acknowledgement highlights a few of the online resources that we recommend you visit. We really recommend you visit these. They're awesome videos that we just didn't have the time to include tonight, but they would be well worth your time and they will be sent to you. All the links will be sent to you in an email. So it'll be easy to, for you to click and just, uh, just watch a few of these and get some more background uh, of things we were mentioning uh, in our program tonight. Um, let's take a look at some of these questions. Margaret, you ready? I see a lot of nice compliments. Um, I saw someone oh, earlier was trying to identify the, uh, the car in the photo, the Lattimore photo. So if anyone could identify the make and model of that car, it would be great. That's what I was saying to Margaret too. Someone that knows about cars probably is going to be able to look at that and give us an idea of the car and perhaps help us um, get a better date for that particular photo. Phyllis Sams, I see you remember remembering your dad attending the Boy Scout meetings at the, at the building that Margaret was talking about. Let's see. How can we purchase the note cards? The note cards are available at the library at the circulation desk on the first floor. And I believe they're 10, 10 in a pack. Um, they're highlighting several of the photos that you've seen here in this program tonight. So you can just stop by the library and, and pick up a copy, it makes a great gift. Do we have anybody that identified our photo of the, uh, in front of the uh, McMurray, um, Flour mill and the car and the dog. No identification, but some some guesses. Um, I'll save the chat after this and print it off for you guys for further oh, investigation. Um, the schoolhouse photo now the site of the Italian restaurant. Sher Sher Charlene, I'm not sure what Italian restaurant you mean. The schoolhouse, the schoolhouse, the 1904 schoolhouse is a private residence that you can see if you drive uh, on Bebot Road under the underpass, um, it'll be on your left side. That's a private home now. The schoolhouse, the restaurant is down at the Thompsonville restaurant. The right, Thompson, that's a different, that's a different school. school, yeah. Yes. Where on Murray Road was the Boy Scout building located? Margaret, do you wanna respond to where the Boy Scout building was located? Tom McMurray, do you want to take that one, Tom? Sure. It's right beside the municipal building. As you go in municipal drive, it would be on the right. Uh, right now is uh, Ted Taylor's building is right there. Okay. Tom, is there any other comments that you want to, um, to add to, to the presentation tonight? Anything else that you recall? Or? I know you two did such a great job of covering all this stuff. There's so much history to cover, and uh, you put everything together so well in a format we could all understand. Thank you. Well, thank you. So we do hope to do that follow-up, which you can uh, shed some more light on. We talked earlier about picking up the McMurray Tom Center or, or sort of reviving it. I guess we'd start with the 1950 or, Carrie, do you remember the exact date the um, the supply store was built? Um, I want to say, I want to say 49. 
Um, yes, 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 you're correct, 1949. And then there was a groundbreaking for the new telephone company. But also we have the whole series, and I know Tom knows this probably, backwards and forwards, the dairy bar and the great stories with the dairy bar up uh, from the blacksmith shop, um, the Simpson blacksmith shop. I think there were four or five different locations before it ever got over to becoming Heisler's Market. But there are some great stories. We just decided that um, we had to do a cutoff sometime. Right. And, yeah. <laughs> I think we had, I think we had almost 50 slides and I pointed out to Margaret that that wouldn't, we would have people here to midnight <laughs> talking <laughs> through all of them. So, so I just said the logical point to kind of stop was, you know, when the mill was taken, taken down Yeah. and we would but, pick it up at a future program, uh, you know, with some more topics. Yeah. But we do have some more on the McMurray town center and we do have a lot on the, the on the, Theory bar and all its name changes and so forth. But um, so how many recall the Boy Scout cabin? Margaret, I see Dick Matthews has made a comment. It says he says it looks like a 1936 Pontiac in that uh, photo. So we'll have to we'll have to see if we can check into that. And further. that's his dad. That also and might mention if he's there that the grant we received. One of the items in the grant is his um. Well, I guess it was his be his great great grandfather's um, diary. That if I can find my notes here, um, one of the grant we received was to get special equipment to digitize fragile materials and oversized materials. And one of them is the Chatham Glenn Matthews diary, and that was written in 1886 to 1890. It's 108 pages. It is fascinating. And we also have Boyd Caldwell Roach's relative, Rachel Bell's diary, written in 1889 to 1890, then 1892 and 1894. And I know Carolyn Friday, the consultant, was really excited about these diaries because it gave living in the township from a perspective of a male and also from the perspective of a female, how they live, what they did, uh, how what their daily life was, what they experienced, what they, um, you know, what the churches they attended. It just is fascinating. So we, um, so we did get that um, approved. And so there was, um, so I'm glad to hear from Dick Matthews. And I'm happy he's here and that we can share that good news that uh, his relatives, um, that diary. And also, if you get back to, which we couldn't, but his family was one of the earliest settlers here in the township. They um, they probably bought their, one of the earliest pieces of land right around this McMurray Town Center. And um, eventually uh, the Matthews property was, some of it was sold to the McMurray family. Harvey McMurray bought many of his early acres from the Matthews family. And also the high school that uh, I think you mentioned, I, um, the high school, no, we didn't cover it in this, we'll cover it in the next one because it opened um, on where the, oh, where the former McMurray Middle School was right across basically from the library. But that was Matthew's property. So he sold to the school district and also uh, the church, St. Benedict Church bought from the Matthews and I even believe um, Opeka Auto Service was on Matthew's property. So when one starts to think about all this that came from those early land, you, you wonder where that road was. And we kind of have a sense of the McMurray Road, but I never did have a good grasp of this Valley Brook Road. Uh, because if you look at some of the photographs in the Matthews collection and you see, you wonder exactly where that road was. So that's kind of, but maybe somebody out there has materials on it. So thank you, um, you know, for, for um, communicating with us, Mr. Matthews. Anything else, Carrie? Um, just people are just sharing some memories about um, the buses that ran on McMurray Road from Pittsburgh to Washington, the suburban line. My dad worked at Hill Station in 1940 and rode the trolley out from Pittsburgh to work at the theater in, in Hill Station. We were talking quite a bit about Hill Station, too, uh, in doing our research. That came up to be a topic as well. 
um, a question about the history of Teeters Township book. Um, they will be for sale at the library circulation desk, so you can pick up a copy there. Um, someone had asked about if they if they don't live in the area. I provided my email address in the chat. Uh, just send me an email with your address, and we'll work out something to get a book. Um, you know, purchase a book and get it out to you. Um, Fred Packer, the McMurray name abounds in our family. In fact, my grandson's name is Charles McMurray Packer. Charles McMurray was my grandfather. And we do have some material from the Packer family. Yes. And, and I've been communicating with this ever since we started, uh, we firmed up our date. And we do have materials. And I do believe we have his relative, a photo of his relative in his band uniform on yeah. display in one of our exhibits. And so um, I understand they're going to be paying us a visit. And I think they're all from out of town that nobody's around here. So again, great to hear from you and happy you're here with us tonight. Friend. Nancy Nancy Barnard comments that the Opeka shop was on the Matthews property. The farmhouse was across yeah. the street from the current location of the shop to the left of Friar Lane. And yes, we are. Uh, we we did have um, Mr. Matthews was part of our oral history project, and he did share yeah. with us a, a lot of documentation. Here, here's mine. Um, so we have Herb Mathis, Mike Berry. Um, Mine just says me. Uh, Valley Brook Cross brush brush run at the site of the vet veterinary place and then ran over the tracks. Above the tracks, you can still th see the road today. Where can we read those diaries? Well, right now, those diaries are uh, in a box waiting to be scanned so we can share that information with you. So we don't have the information. We just received the grant um, last month to purchase equipment to scan those. So once that is done, that, that information, Margaret, will that be uploaded? Well, to PA I, I photos? Can, well, yes, I can tell you a little bit more about the grant. Okay. Um, it, uh, we're not allowed to start by the equipment, do anything with the grant until May 2022. Then uh, we can begin the grant, and it's two years. They're allowing us two years to um, to digitize these materials and to uh, purchase the archival supplies that will house these very fragile materials. So it will be sometime. Um, so I'm not sure because we're not allowed to start it until 20 May 2022. And I know one of the tasks Carolyn Frederick, Frederick will, will be undertaking is setting up that equipment and um, the foundation will be matching that grant. So they will be looking at the person that will be digitizing for us. So that is in the future, but we're just so pleased to say at least we will be part of preserving these invaluable resources and allowing access to them that we couldn't when they were in their such fragile state. So thanks for that. Thank you for your question. Margaret, um, Jan Matthews is, is in the Zoom. Uh, her father was Bob Matthews, so she's, she's watching tonight. And I'm so happy. I've talked to Jan Matthews on many occasions, and I'm just delighted that she's here with us. And I hope Jan and the other Matthews family members around will stop in and visit our archives as each and every one of you that are in the areas or come back to visit uh, to, to visit our archives because we're really proud of them. And we know it depends on your support, again, like Lacey mentioned in the beginning, both financial support to keep an archivist on board and also your support of looking for those materials. Sometimes I get these great leads and you must call, you must call this person and that person. And too often I receive a response, oh my goodness, I didn't think anybody would be interested in those photographs. We don't have them. So just think about that. And it's not as though we expect you to give us everything because a lot of times you have many copies. And as Carrie said, you're taking a family, not really realizing what's in the background could be so important. So even if you share, you know, some parts of your collection about the history of what it was like in Peter's Township, what it was, um, I know Lacey in the beginning says something that was really important. 
uh, we're we're tonight we're talking about the late 1800s and we're talking about the early 1900s but you know history is also you know you went to school the 60s the 70s the 80s the 90s those materials are valuable because we started i know many persons keep wanting us to do a program on the restaurants the early restaurants but after those really early years we kind of lose sight of what was out there so it's those years after like the, um, that, that we start to thinking about, gee, bring those in and they're just fun to look at and we can put together another program. Um, Margaret, I'm looking at uh, some of the topics, some of the responses for the poll. Um, no surprise, it looks like the dairy bar is, is, is the top response at 57%. And we kind of knew that. Um, throughout doing this presentation, we kept finding bits and pieces of dairy bar um, history and I kept telling Margaret just put that aside put that aside because I knew that was going to be a huge popular topic at, and maybe we would uh, give that a separate uh, program it deserves all by itself so I, I see that's the number one selection followed by the schoolhouses uh, and Donaldson's crossroads of course Mr. Donaldson has a huge collection of photos uh, he's documented the development of uh, Route 19 up there at the crossroads for many, many years. And, As uh, has um, uh, Ed Liebarger, and I do believe yes. he's here with us tonight. He, Ed Liebarger, and his friend Robert Donaldson have a, an amazing collection okay. documenting the crossroads. Yes. So it looks like it looks like we have a lot of work ahead of us, Margaret, to uh, to cover these topics. Um, let's see if there are any other questions I'm looking to see. Someone mentions Carrie Trax, of course, the Trax family, another uh, a, a well-known name in the area. History of Hacka, definitely, because we have a lot of information about the mining uh, and the development of that village. Is that correct, Margaret? Well, I, I, yes, but we're trying to get the originals. Yes. Because since we've been working with an archivist, one of the uh, fundamentals principles working with the archivist is you you acquire the originals, you preserve the originals, and then you digitize them and digitized copies are available to the public or they're so fragile, some are not as fragile as others. So you visit the library, but they are in folders and they are in boxes. So we have copies of Hackett, but we've been diligently trying to call on persons and that's where I've been following some of the leads. So if any of you out there can share some, oh, some originals, there's just a rich, rich history of Hackett as the mining town, just an incredible story. And um, I mean, Hackett in Venetia, I mean, you talk about Venetia, love to find out about the hotel up in Venetia, but down in Hackett, they're so proud of um, their rich heritage. So, um, you know, again, it just turns to, to um, looking at you our audience to be partners in us in trying to expand our archives and make it a treasured resource for our community who um, is, is looking at it from the perspective of memories. But we will end up with such an amazing resource that um, historians will be able to study the materials, especially from the rapid development, how it went from that rural mining community in maybe like a 15 year period where was, there was a rapid increase of persons moving to the township and changing it into less of the rural to almost a suburban. And sometimes people look at Route 19 and they forget suburban. They say, whoa, we're really become an urban area. So all that's really important. And I think the fact that we're able to house these materials here and to have this expert help, thanks to the, our uh, wonderful foundation, um, you know, again, we can bring more of these stories or share them, uh, the digital materials, and those that live by will be able to come in and to research them. So again, you know, our thanks and spread the word. And so Mark, happy you're here tonight. Yes, Carrie. Margaret, what's the process if somebody wants to donate? I mean, I know there's a, there is a form they fill out or yes, what, how do do. things, how do things, people don't, people shouldn't just come and bring boxes of materials. Is that right? They, there's a process to go through? Well, yes. 
kind of so that we can talk about what kinds of materials are we the best institution are we the best nonprofit are the, we the best facility for the materials that they want to donate and if we're not then perhaps we can guide them to where those materials belong but if they are if we are the best uh, um, library or history or whatever to take those materials we have a process one is like we both um, the donor and us to accept the materials have a uh, a, um, a, a collection policy, what we collect and why we collect it. Then we have a donor form and that donor form, then they agree to give us. And by that agreeing to us, they allow us to digitize those materials and make them available to the public. So again, and it's only in the last couple of years, we've changed, and I know you know this well, Carrie, we used to operate as the history room. Right. We no longer operate as our local history room. We're really trying to become the Peters Township Public Library archives, and we're following all those standards. So you can pick up the phone. I know Lacey is here. She's from time. You and I are part-time, so it's probably easier to talk to her. But I know she can talk to us, and um, we always return calls, and we're really happy to... Um, to speak to you if you have materials or if you're giving us leads. So we're following our practices that we've just put into place recently, but that's good because you know what you give us will be preserved. So thank you. And, and shared with the community yeah. in, in these types of programs. And, uh, and you know, your family will be acknowledged every step of the way for your donations and, and get our gratitude for any donations. Um, and so we're doing our displays, too, as part of our outreach. Right. And, you know, little things matter. When you work in here and you're kind of in here, um, and then we put together an exhibit. We did an exhibit in recognition of the opening of Peters Township's new, newest high school. I think that was its fifth location. And I can just say Tom McMurray was president of the school board at the, um, the opening of that high school. And along the way, there's almost been a McMurray family member, four generations that have been part of the Peters Township High School throughout the years. If you recall back when Carrie was telling you that first high school was built in that McMurray, McMurray's Mill area in a dwelling owned by either Herbie McMurray or his son. And then it went on to the next school and there were four school directors, as I recall, and right. they all built that high school. And it's probably a pretty good guess that they financially supported that high school. And um, we have just so many wonderful records. And again, I think they're from um, Mrs. Um, Hutchison's file that go back to like the late 1800s. We've got all kinds of school board reports and treasurer's reports. But anyway, so there was the five schools. and. Um, we're proud to have those records. And right, it, uh, Margaret. The the schoolhouses from the one room schoolhouses to the new, the new Peters Township High School. Five locations. Yes. Yeah. I mean, so that was and, a popular choice for a for a program. Yeah, and Tom well. and and Tom McMurray was involved. Uh, I mean, his family was involved in every one of those schools. Right. Uh, so one thing I wanted to say. So then, when in recognition of that, we um, created an exhibit. And that exhibit is on the second floor. And now it's been replaced by this uh, McMurray Town Center. But one day, the uh, public relations person for Peters Township was in the library. And she took photos of that exhibit that the library created, recognizing the opening of the dedication of the new high school. So anyway, I was just so pleased that that exhibit showed up in the Peters Township calendar for 2021-2022. I believe it is the January 2022. <laughs> so it's right this month. Our library exhibit is in the, um, the, the township calendar. And, you know, I might also say Tom McMurray and his wife, um, Sandy, are so helpful because if I need something, he's um, right on the phone. And the next thing, if, like I can go home and I can back the next day and it's right here in this history room. So I think, you know, I'm really pleased that we have such good rapport with our school district. So, anything Margaret, else? It looks like we are at 814, and we said we were going to wrap up at 815 tonight. So, um, I think, you know, all this hard work we've done, 
uh, has paid off and, and turned into a, a really informative program. I think um, we've gotten a lot of good messages out about the library, the archives, uh, donations, uh, purchasing the historical cards, the uh, the book about the history of Peters Township. And also don't forget to follow those links that we've sent you in the email um, to learn more, to get a little bit more in depth uh, to some of the areas that we weren't able to delve into longer uh, here tonight. Um, also, if you uh, would like to be stay informed, there is a link that you will be sent about signing up for our newsletter. And I'm sure a lot of you people uh, have, have subscriptions to our weekly newsletter. That is the best place to learn about programs, resources, and uh, anything happening at the library, uh, especially you know with uh, winter time and any changes in the schedule or something like that. Sign up for our newsletter, and that will keep you most informed about what is happening. So I guess, Margaret, our work is cut out for us. We have a, a, some programs to work on. Um, and I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Margaret, do you want to say anything to finalize things here tonight? Uh, I just want to thank every everybody. And I just uh, extend my deepest appreciation for your support. And I hope that you will go and to look at PA photos of documents and um, contact uh, Lacey Carrie, myself, come and meet uh, Carolyn, our archivist, and just be part of our archives. It's your community, your library, and um, we know you treasure it. And hopefully we've communicated to you how much we treasure being part of this right. township. Right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night.